Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Omnia Performance Podcast with myself, Fergus Crawley, and... Myself. We Johnny Payne. We Johnny Payne. We're going with that now. We are, yeah. You, you're, you're henceforth known as We Johnny Payne, because you are little... And Johnny Payne. And Johnny Payne, yeah. That does what it says on the tin, really. Well done. <laughs> well done. You're like a baked bean. <laughs> Well, you're about as you're you're about the same color in the sunlight, anyway. We, we have digressed before we've even began. Today is going to be about strength and marathon training, all the things that you could well be doing wrong. You might be doing lots of things right, but we've worked with thousands of athletes over the years on exactly this, and feel that we we've picked up a thing or two about where mistakes are made, where improvements can be made, and some things to consider so that you can nail your strength and marathon training. If you really want to nail your strength and marathon training, then we we have a website that you might have might have seen before if not go go check it out there's some there's some stuff there that might help with exactly this but that is enough of that before we dive into today's conversation it is important to ask a couple of things from you if you wouldn't mind following or subscribing to the show on whatever platform you're listening on make sure to share this episode or an episode previously with a friend save it for later if this is something you're going to come back to and do rate the show five stars and review it on apple Podcasts if you're listening there as well please thank you very much so Strength and marathon, the balancing of. Today we're going to go through sort of three headline chapters, I, think, I yeah, guess, I aren't think we? So. I think there'll be some crossover and, and the kind of uh, uh, links between all three. But I think, yeah, let, let's go with three kind of headline. So we're going to discuss the consolidation of stresses. Yeah. Junk volume. Uh, and session detail. Session detail. And then actually what we're going to do is we're going to take an example week, week nine from the Strength of Marathon plan that we have on the website, which I've got in front of me here, just to bring that to life a little bit in terms of how we see things. Yeah, and how, how, how what we've discussed kind of fits into that plan kind of makes sense. Got a bit of context at the end, I think. So a choice of three things to begin with, Johnny. Let's begin with consolidation of stressors uh, and just kind of clarify what the hell that even means. Um, it means we're going to consolidate the stressors. Should we, should we, should Jeremy, is that done? Yeah. End the podcast. Thanks, everyone. Rate, right now, rate and review, all that stuff. Thanks. So within the within the bulk of programming, because we're looking at this kind of hybrid style of programming, we're considering that, that uh, if we consider two pointy ends of, uh, of the spectrum, we have strength at one end and we have uh, uh, aerobic endurance at the other end. There's many, many elements to that and that, that, that uh, simplifies it too far. Uh, but across that spectrum, we've got different energy systems and different uh, focuses that we need to look at within the body of a training plan in order to facilitate the best outcome that we want. Uh, if we just go at all that within the, the, the space of a, a microcycle, so a given week within a program, and say, right, we're going to put some of this in, we're going to put some of that in, all the rest of it, then it can get a little bit complex and one thing can sit over the top of another and we get uh, the closest really to the, this interference effect, this problem that people experience uh, uh, that that we really would suggest happens. Uh, so, for instance, if we if we try and if we try and put high intensity work alongside low intensity work or high intensity uh, fossil creating driven work alongside low intensity aerobic work, uh, the two of them aren't matched in terms of overall profile of that programming uh, and and the the overlap uh, and you get that kind of interference. You get interference just from a practical sense as well. It becomes like, which part am I doing? What do I give it the focus to, etc. Important to mention that that doesn't prevent adaptation. It just blunts the response potentially, which means yeah, exactly. so, so, so it's a case of it's, we are trying to sub, well, optimize the suboptimal, which means that by looking at an intelligent micro cycle and, and how that repeats and, and develops over time towards the goal. We're trying to build in recovery within that from session to session by bringing multiple stressors, as you mentioned, that might sit across one energy system or another, but they're closer grouped so that you're not kind of just thrashing yourself on a variety of components that in and of themselves are a component of marathon training and strength training, how they're ordered, why they're that way, what the session detail is, as we'll come on to, and how they're put together is how you effectively go from just doing lots of things and hoping for the best to having a progressive, intelligent program that you can develop and move forwards with over time. Agreed. I think three key parts to that there, a couple of words you said directly. Uh, one would be specificity. Uh, one would be adaption or adaptation, depending which way you want to say that. Uh, and one would be recovery, as you say. If we haven't consolidated the stresses, the things that we're putting our bodies through, 
into a, a meaningful order, uh, then those three things are harder to achieve. It's as simple as that. And and that's where this kind of, it, it can be managed. There still can be adaptation. There still can be progress. But if we want it to be quote unquote optimal, uh, then it makes sense to kind of look at these things structurally and say, well, where can they fit best within a microcycle? Where can I put them best within the week so that I can get the most out of each one of them and so that I can get the most opportunity to recover from each one of them uh, and so that each session can then be specific. So we, practically speaking, manage this on a inverted volume and intensity curve, whereby intensity peaks at the start of the week and bottoms out, bottoms out at the end of the week and volume peaks at the end of the week and bottoms out at the start of the week. And what that effectively means is that heavier, faster stuff is earlier in the, the, con- the sort of concept of a microcycle or a week. Moderate sub-threshold, six to ten reps on main compound exercises in the middle of the week, strength endurance dominant, high Roxy style, Metconny style work is towards the end, and then aerobic stuff will be at the tail end of it. Exactly that. And it really isn't, it really isn't extraordinarily complex, uh, barring what we're doing is analysing those stresses in the first place. So another way to look at exactly as you've described is if we look at it from a resistance training perspective, then at the beginning of the week we're looking at high intensity work. So we're looking at something at 80 to 85% and above, uh, which cannot be done at volume. You, you just simply can't continue that in a, in a, in a high volume manner. Um, middle of the week, as you say, six to eight, well, eight to 12 reps maybe. Uh, we're looking at something between I don't know, 45 to 65, maybe 70% of your one rep max, which is generally where people find themselves in that kind of bodybuilding, kind of what people are used to when they think of uh, rep ranges. And then towards the end of the week, we're looking at much, much less on that scale. So as you say, high intensity to start with, and then the resistance work drops. The volume of the uh, of the of the uh, cardiovascular system is, is built on the energy systems profile. So at the beginning of the week, we're looking at hard, fast, explosive efforts, which can't be done at high volume because you need a long recovery time between each bout. Middle of the week, where they can look at uh, threshold or sort of lactate glycogen driven efforts, uh, which uh, can be higher intensity but still need a relatively you know, larger recovery time. And then, as you say, towards the end of the week, we're looking at uh, low intensity, steady state work, which is longer uh, uh, and, and less immediately intense, uh, but has its own kind of uh, uh, profile and factors that we need to consider across the body of that work. I think the, the best example to really hone in on this with is consolidating stresses, quote unquote, into heavy lower body and hard effort track work in the same day. Are they in the same energy system? Absolutely not. Is there a bit of a biomechanical crossover and are they in the same sort of intensity grouping within each respective discipline? For the most part, yes. And the reason that we put those together is so that effectively there is one spike in intensity early in the week that then sort of tapers down before we sort of peak it back up again. Yeah, the the issue that... that over many years looking at this stuff that people come across as this kind of undulating effort. So let's say day one, Monday, they're going to do a hard, high-intensity uh, session, hit perhaps. Uh, day two, well, yesterday was hard, so today I'll do a lower-intensity session. There's a logic to it, a, a, a very, an intelligent logic. Day three, okay, yesterday was more about recovery. I'm going to do another hard session. And this undulation means that because the recovery over the course of a longer time frame, in, in our case, a given week, uh, isn't given time to, to, to bed in properly, by the time you get to the second high intensity session, the ability to apply that intensity is degraded. And therefore, the if there's skill elements, that's degraded. Uh, and the adaption is degraded. If you then drop back, undulate down into, into a, a lower intensity session on the Thursday and then back into another high intensity on, on, on the Friday, then that Friday session can no longer be uh, as, as specific as you want it to be. There, there's just a much degraded opportunity to, to adapt and a much degraded opportunity to develop skill and much less opportunity for focus to be delivered. You know, uh, and, and the key detail here is that DUP generally applies to single disciplines. Well, and what other, we're trying yeah. to manage here is the, the, the demand of trying to adapt and progress in one end of the spectrum versus the other, which means we're turning down certain dials, turning up certain dials, highlighting strengths and weaknesses in the individual. If anyone's doing a training plans, it's kind of up to you to dictate where you see your strengths and weaknesses and how you you sort of tailor things to that. But what we're trying to do is to manage cumulative and week by week fatigue that builds up from operating at one end of the spectrum and the other because they do get in the way of one another and you need to recover from either or to be able to perform in either or. And then a big concept in in this space that isn't spoken about enough and we see just completely ignored in a lot of quote-unquote hybrid stuff that people are talking about now that are 
dare I say, newer to the game. And that is that fatigue masks fitness, whereby yeah. Yeah. as fatigue builds, your actual top end output will be disguised by fatigue, whereby you might feel like you're getting weaker, your heart rate's maybe getting less efficient, but what's actually happening is fatigue is climbing as adaptation is sort of occurring, which means that as you taper off, deload and let all of that sort of settle, you're recovering from being worked very hard towards the top end in two separate components. So all of a sudden you feel fresh and fantastic. And then, oh, I'm stronger than I was before because you can't, it's, it's, it's like going into, if you go to a CrossFit class where you've got, oh, we've got a heavy front squat today, one RM front squat on the Thursday after you've had Fran on Monday, Murph on Tuesday, yeah. and then an absolute hell for leather chipper session on Wednesday. That's not a one RM front squat. That's a daily RPE nine single if we're sort of talking in Louis Simmons terms as a way of, it's the most that you could put out on that day within the context of the day and the fatigue surrounding it. It's not a true reflection of your output, which is why specific training, specific testing, tapering, deloading is such a core component, but why training is training and the metrics are there within the context of consolidated stresses within our methodology to be able to sort of continue to chip, do the reps, do the reps and accumulate the volume, work capacity, and ability to tolerate those over time so that you can chip away when it comes to revealing that. You can't just linearly progress week to week, month to month, once you hit a certain level of proficiency. And to be honest, if you're considering training in strength and marathon performance concurrently, where you're looking to either maintain your strength or progress alongside progressing towards a marathon or a better marathon performance, you will be at a point of training adaptation where you you can't just rely on noob gains and linear progression. So that's why the consolidation and stresses <laughs> sound like the the, uh, the the that bulldog in the insurance adverts. Uh, the, the Churchill bulldog. The Churchill bulldog, yeah. Uh, which is probably just a caricature of Winston Churchill, actually, I've just realised. Yeah. Anyway, you can't rely on noob gains and sort of a, a perfect upward curve on the graph because you've, you've kind of move past that and you're kind of fighting for every little bit of adaptation through intelligent, sensible, specific programming. So I think in summary, by trying to group your intensity and volume components into similar points within the week, as, as we like to do, you will be better managing the biomechanical and physiological demand of the adaptation you're looking for so that within the context of a microcycle and therefore spread out over a mesocycle and, and beyond, you are following a formula and a pattern that makes any downturns or upticks in fatigue, downturns of performance, upticks in fatigue, a little bit more easy to understand where they've come from and how cumulative fatigue is having an impact. Because all of the science on strength training can be taken into consideration for your strength training as a hybrid athlete. All of the science on marathon training can be taken into consideration for your performance as a hybrid athlete. But all of that is not in consideration of the other end of the spectrum. So right. you need right. to yeah. you need to understand that and aim to drum roll, please. I don't know if that's audible. Optimize the suboptimal. Next point, Johnny. Well, there you go. Well, the next point bleeds, or that point bleeds into the next point really particularly well. Is one thing that we see is you had to make it violent, didn't you? Bleeds, uh, feeds. You could have said feeds, uh, follows into. I'm not sure that's violent. I think you've made that violent. Well, I'm Something saying across you, into, which uh, makes me take it as violent. Into, uh, into Whatever. Yeah, if you're Jeffrey Chaucer. <laughs> Which I am. <laughs> Reveal. Uh, <gasps> uh, I can't remember what I was going to say. We're talking about bleeding into. Oh, yeah. So so your last point, or the last point, bleeds actually perfectly into this second point. And I did say at the beginning that it'd be kind of a kind of marrying up between these is that we've, we've looked at kind of consolidating that week in terms of stressors. Uh, and, and there's almost a kind of a. A, a lovely segue in here in, into thinking about each session as having its own specific demand, which we've clearly identified. Uh, but the focus within that session uh, is something I think that we see a, a lot of uh, hybrid athletes make mistakes with, or, or new newcomers to this kind of uh, uh, blending of of, yep. uh, of different elements and different. And skills. I'm going to say, not in a critical sense, but I think has become even more confused by fitness racing, like Hyrox, OCR, no, agree, where, where, agree, yeah, where yeah. people don't see individual components of energy systems as contributing to the ability to blend them and only yeah. see training the blend. Fact. Not, not to jump away from the marathon for, for more than a few seconds, but that, that is a, a perfectly good example of how it can become an uncomfortable bleed through. We're, we're, we're not 
if we don't focus directly on what it is that we're actually looking to adapt, then we lose that opportunity to adapt. Uh, and there's also a psychological element to that as well, as if we have a, a session plan uh, which is trying to cater for a lot of different things at once, uh, then it tends to be much more difficult to, to find yourself in the right psychological state for that. So let's frame it as a question to you. Johnny, All right. I'm training for a functional fitness competition. Or let's, you know, let's keep it topical. I'm training for a high rocks. Why would I do heavy triples on a back squat? Uh, because it's going to make you stronger. And being stronger is going to allow you to produce force at a greater rate, which is going to allow you to then continue, et cetera, et cetera. But if you, if you work each end of that scale appropriately, and you work across that scale, then you develop all the physiological characteristics that you can then apply to high rocks uh, in a much more adaptive manner. Uh, and then you just use that and then specify your training uh, closer to the, you, you sharpen the tools closer to the, to the event. If you're trying to constantly do high rocks to prepare for high rocks, which is what we see a lot of, uh, then you are probably developing a, a skill based uh, 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 adaption much more so than you're actually uh, developing the, the underlying uh, physiological components that, that then will play into that skill base. You're saying a lot of words. I've still got my my, uh, my my hypothetical hat on here, by the way. This isn't Fergus talking back to you. This is hypothetical high rockser, HH. Hypothetical high rockser, Harry, HHH. <laughs> Harry, the hypothetical high rockser. Ah, hypothetical high rocks, Harry, who's got so distracted he's forgotten what his question was. Ah, yes, you're saying a lot of words, Johnny, but I am if I'm going to be competing in this manner, shouldn't I just do that all the time? No. You want more? I, I would like more, yes, please. <laughs> and I'll then Fergus Fergus's hat's back on. Um, for anyone listening, I am actually wearing a hat, so you should go to YouTube and check this out because the, the, the visual effects are, are stunning. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll tie it back to marathon prep as we go. Yeah, yeah. This is a good segue for this particular reason, because if you, if you want to get better at high rocks, then you're going to want to get stronger. You're going to want to get faster. What are all the key elements of high rocks? You're going to want, you want to get more explosive. You're going to be able to, to apply more force. You want to have a better aerobic capacity. You want to have a better threshold capacity. It's a threshold test, in my opinion. Um, ideally, uh, you want, well, not ideally, absolutely, you need to develop those skills. But the very nature of high rocks is it's not a high skill sport. It's a threshold based sport where you can apply that skill fast, efficiently, and then move on to the next one uh, without burning yourself out so much that you slow down. If you're going to do that, you're going to need to develop all the components that, that are applied in there. So you have to develop strength. You have to develop aerobic capacity. You have to develop threshold capacity. If you're trying to do that all within a program which is meshing all those together all, all the time, then you're buffering uh, and slowing down your opportunity to, to recover from that. So an intelligent, consolidated, stress-consolidated approach uh, makes a hell of a lot more sense. And then as you get closer and closer to the event, you can develop more and more specificity for the tasks at hand. But you should have developed the physiological components that lead to that ability to specify your, your, your skill-based components. And because it's less skill-based than other sports, uh, it's, uh, that's not a priority demand at the beginning of a program. So, Great clip. Could Jamie, be. have you noted that one down? Excellent, excellent. Anyway, in terms of marathon stuff, it applies the same. The same it well, applies to every running distance, in fact, where yeah. a, a common mistake people make, especially with 5Ks, 10Ks, is assuming that because you are going to be doing your best effort 5k at your best effort 5k pace therefore most of your training should be best effort 5k when in reality and this is probably a bit more topical for people we've spoken about it here before as with marathon prep as with 5k prep it sits on a foundation of aerobic capacity and then it is the specific session detail of the sessions within the week that develop your ability to move at a faster pace and your aerobic capacity that sits beneath that allows you to hold that for longer. So if you develop a big work capacity, you can then tolerate more work at higher intensity, and those two move in conjunction. But if you're just doing high intensity work, you're going to be leaving the ability to sustain that on the table because it's lacking, I guess, the uh, the engine that sits behind it. So if you just have your foot to the floor the whole time, you're lacking the transition transmission that allows you to shift gears or something along those lines. Yeah. So yeah. within, the, within the concept of marathon stuff, 
Well, yeah, to I mean, tie it back, the, the, the high rock stuff speaks to it to a certain degree because what what we're looking at there is a good example that people that people understand a kind of a, a, a an immediate example of the fact that as we said in the previous point, if you're throwing a lot in at once, then what is adapting? What is it? What is it you're looking at? It's not particularly scientific if you think about it. If you've got ten variables working all at once, which one is the independent? Which one is 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 not? Which one's actually making the difference? We don't know because there's too much in the in the bully pot. So if we come back to the very beginning of oh, sorry the, the 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 second point that we're trying to make, which is is session focus, we're actually speaking to the previous point as well. Uh, and then there's a psychological focus, which I was going to touch on, which is that if, for instance, we have, which is something that we very much lean into, a heavy lower body day back to back with heavy lower body sprints, let's say, that day is a day that you are going to have to psychologically prepare for in a very different way than you might prepare for a uh, two and a half hour long run, which might be your longest run yet, um, because of the, 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 the sustaining effort is psychologically different. You know, as, as, a, as a previously uh, died in the wool powerlifter, that to get your head in the game for what should be around about a, a, you know, a three rep max or sort of a maximum effort for that day, you, your, your mental arousal state has to be very, very different from also your ultra experience and your marathon experience. You have to be in a very, very different mindset than if you were to say, well, I'm going to go out and try and sustain a certain pace for two and a half hours. If we focus a day on two of those kind of competing uh, stressors, uh, then your psychological state has to try and flip backwards and forwards between those two things. So psychologically, it makes sense to actually consolidate stresses as well because your focus is now today is a day where I am, I'm, I'm harnessing a certain energy, uh, which might sound a little bit wishy-washy, but there's lots of uh, sports uh, psychology. The, men, the mental too. arousal around it is massive. It's about, uh, the sports uh, psychology I, yeah. we could lean into quite hard here and say that you, know, you, you, you can't really flip backwards and forwards between the two of them. You can think that you can, but you can't you get yourself into one mental state and then into another within moments with, without losing some of the o overall capacity for that, for that arousal state to be productive. So physiologically, we want to have uh, a, a, an adaptive... Well, let's look at the session detail in, 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 in a specific way. What are we trying to get from that session? Well, in that session I described lower body, uh, uh, high intensity lower body resistance work, high intensity lower body uh, repeat work. We're looking at force demand. We're looking at strength uh, uh, increase. We're looking at, at skill base uh, and we're looking at using uh, different rest periods, etc., within this fossil creating system where, where we adapt that system and, and our ability to interact with repeat bouts, et cetera, et cetera, which speaks to other energy systems, but ultimately we're trying to produce one uh, a specific outcome. So there's no confusion. You're there for that thing. You're there physiologically for that thing and there psychologically for that thing. And you can build out a session based on those needs and, and there's no kind of fluff in around it. Same at the other end. If, you, if you're doing a, a, a long aerobic set, uh, and, and again, use the same example, we're out for two and a half hours. If you're also halfway through that, decided to do a three rep max, You've you've really eaten into your psychological state, but you've also eaten into the adaptive processes, and, and nobody would suggest you do such a thing. But what we're doing when we don't consolidate stresses and trying to just put everything into a program over the course of the week is, you know, physiologically saying, right in the middle of this set, I'm going to go for a two-hour run, then come back and do the third set, and it's just inappropriate. So to summarise within the context of strength and marathon training, you need to look at the individual components of what you're trying to achieve, which is top end strength, which comes from Compound, compound movements, variations of those compound movements and specific assistance work that in essence should be highlighting your weak points. So uh, yeah, this is where you, you can look at elements of other methodology, West Side, their focus on weak point training, et cetera, is very clear, yeah. stuff like that. So essentially from a strength point of view, highlight your weaknesses, hammer them, but make sure that the individual components are, are there and you're not just doing heavy singles, heavy doubles and heavy triples and nothing but because you're training for a one RM, that would not make sense. In the same way, your marathon prep should be a combination of different elements. So interval, speed work, tempo, sub-threshold stuff, aerobic work, and then marathon-specific pacing practices to get more and more specific. So it all needs to sit on a foundation of work done individually before it is then sort of comes together as the finished article within the tail end of a training prep. So reflect on your own training, look at what it looks like, and make sure that if you can't quite explain why there is a session within there for the week, then assess what it's doing there, whether it could be subbed in for something a bit more specific or whether it actually is maybe just adding junk volume, which junk is point volume. number three. It is. Let me give you a quick analogy on the, on the a Johnny Payne analogy. On, on no, the no, no, we, I seamlessly moved into... We're definitely going to do it. If you... Jamie Cut. 
please. If, Thank you. If you've got uh, a, a, a task at hand, any task at all, let's not consider training. If you if you're at home and you've got to you got to wash your windows, you got to clean your floor, and you've got a couple of phone calls to make, how many people are going to start washing the window? attach a mop to their foot and start washing the floor and make those calls at the same time. None of those tasks are going to get done right. They're all going to get done, potentially, but very, very suboptimally. If you focus on the specific task in hand, I'm going to wash these windows just now. Afterwards, I'm going to make a call. And afterwards, I'll come back and do the floors. All three jobs should get done right. And what I see in programming is a whole mess of tasks. Because all those tasks need done, so it makes sense to put them in the program. They all need, they all need work. Uh, but they're all in there on a particular day, in a particular session, within a particular hour sometimes. And how can that job possibly get done well if your focus is all over the shop? So pick your task and do it right. I'll allow it. I'll allow it. Thank you. And as as much junk as is a foot mop, as can be volume. We're really trying to get this. I'm not letting you ruin that for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I think there's a real common understanding in marathon training as to what your weekly mileage, what X, Y, Z should look like that becomes a common and repeated thing that people just buy into. Go on any Reddit thread, go on letsrun.com, go on any live strong guide to your first marathon and it will tell you how many miles you should be running every week. It doesn't really give you an indication on pace. It doesn't really take into account your body weight, your training history, and all of these arbitrary numbers get thrown around. None of the above is accounted for. People make it inconceivable that you could run a marathon on 40 miles a week of training. Unless you're running back-to-back 60-mile weeks, then there's no way that you can do a marathon in your goal time. When in reality, the experience of individual marathon runners is a different set of experiences for those that are trying to balance strength and marathon training. So if you're listening at this point and you're just focusing on marathon training, then a lot of what we're probably going to cover right now doesn't necessarily apply. But... Not, not, Most not of our listeners as, are trying to balance much, it. It still probably applies, yeah. say, but yeah. But uh, essentially, if you're going to let's run dot com, if you're going to forums that are only focused on people training for marathons and not taking into account strength work, hypertrophy work, if you're coming from a higher body weight, if you're coming from a higher muscle mass, then the context is wrong. In the same way, if you walked into Sephora and asked for a bubble tea, they'd probably go, I don't know, is, what is Sephora? I, I why know. Why is that the shop that came to mind? <laughs> I don't Hang on, know Sephora. what a bubble tea is, mate. Sephora. I just, uh, I just blanked. Is there. Sephora, a, 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 I think it's a teenage girl's jewellery shop. Oh, my God. Uh, send your skin all the love for less. Pandora. I was thinking of Pandora, but I said Sephora, which is interesting. Mm. Why is that in my head? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a female... Fe- with their female bro. beauty. Well, anyway, yeah, so so don't go into Sephora and order bubble tea unless they do sell bubble tea and I'm misinformed. In the <laughs> Please same, help me understand uh, why this is going to be an analogy. I don't in, a, in the same way that you... Yeah, the context is wrong. If you walk into, oh, okay. if you walk into right. Right. one shop... At, exp- if you walk into one shop expecting a certain context when in fact it's not there then you can't take the advice for the products within it it's kind of it, my own distraction ruined <laughs> that, was, that but that was almost essentially a Johnny Payne analogy. That if was, you walk into so convoluted, if you step into one set of contextual circumstances that don't apply to you in any way shape or form and then become dogmatic about sticking to them then you're just you're swimming in the wrong lane in the same way that <laughs> Same with triathlon. It, it's a, you must swim this many hours a week. You must do this to do an Ironman. No, you can get you can get there on much less. Do you want it's, to do your best effort thing. time? Do you want it to be this? But it's it's not yeah, as simple yeah. as that. And that's where we're, mileage we're, is a metric. The most common question I get with anything that I train for: How many miles a week do you expect to be doing? That's we do. We, we, we focus on time to start with, and then yeah. we focus on what can be recovered from. We look at the context week to week as to where the strength training is impacting things, because you can't just incrementally increase everything linearly and expect to keep making progress unless you are able to linearly consume more and more and sleep more and more as you go which look at it from almost other, everyone on the planet can't yeah look at it from the other end of the lens uh, the other end of the spectrum let's let's look at it uh, from a strength training perspective you wouldn't say to somebody and this is why this is odd anyway in my mind that's why when you said if you were just doing kind of marathon training it might not apply quite so much i, I think it does drop the equipment there I think it does apply to a certain degree anyway, because if you look at strength training, you're not going to say, right, I want a 200 kilo squat. How many weights, how much weight should I be lifting by week nine? You can't answer that question. You can't say, okay, week one, you're going to lift 100. Week two, you're going to lift 110. Week 320. Uh, if you get a great week, week four and five, we're going to try for 150. It's not going to work like that. You would have to say to the person, well, what we want you to do is focus on 
the frequency that you can spend in the gym repeating that process. We want you to focus on the volume overall that you can uh, account for within within your training week. We want you to focus on recovery. Uh, and essentially, we're, so in that context, we're looking at kind of time spent repeating the process in order to create an adaption. The same applies with, with running, with any kind of adaption, is that if you categorize it based on a, a sort of an abstract metric that you hope will will somehow come true by the end of it, uh, then then you, you're just adding more weight arbitrarily and hoping that you can recover from it. So if I say, by the time I want to go to, to my next ultra marathon, I want to have prepped for being able to run 100k per week, does that take into account all the things that you've suggested? My age, my knee injury, the, uh, the amount of weight training that I'm doing, the fact that I have the children, the business, all this kind of stuff. So we've got all these other things and you think well, that is no longer a metric that has, you know, affords me any value whatsoever. Um, so actually we focus on, on, on the adaptive process. We focus on the time spent within a particular uh, physiological range adapting to that, to that exposure. Uh, and as I say, that's time usually spent out there. And actually the other, the other thing that's important in that when we bring it back to this kind of hybrid scenario is that some of the things that you're doing in your training program uh, should speak to the outcome as well. So you're not, this is, where, this is where your point becomes very, very valid, is that you're no longer just running. If you're also lifting because you have a, 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 you know, a lifting demand or you want to get stronger or you, you have a particular goal, you've got to factor in the fatigue of that, the fact that some of that stuff, when we consolidate those stressors, actually speaks to it. There's some kind of hypoxic return. There's there's a metabolic acidosis that's happening that we need to buffer through different kind of uh, uh, running uh, segments, which then speaks to different kind of threshold training that we're doing within that musculature during resistance training, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It gets complex. So if you said, but I must run 100 kilometers a week, at some point you're going to injure yourself. And there is a real trend on TikTok reels and, uh, and people that are just getting into being coming from a background of being jacked and strong and just adding running in yeah. creating a narrative that you should simply just lift every evening six nights a week and run every morning six days a week and incrementally build that over time that is going to catch up with you it's going to catch up with anyone that takes that advice on and it is not intentional specific or individual to the demand at hand and you can't rely on linear upward curves I think the, the 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 example I always try and use to frame this is we're all quite up to speed with the fact that if you're trying to improve your body composition and get leaner whilst holding on to muscle mass, then it's kind of safe and, and advisable. You don't really push your deficit more beyond maybe a pound or just over a pound a week. Otherwise, you're probably going to be pushing into affecting performance, affecting cognitive, cognitive ability, feeling a bit miserable and making it harder to sustain the diet. So sustainable weight loss is the best way to hold on to any muscle that you've built, feel good in the process of doing it, and generally that's quite widely accepted. But that's because that's the sort of maximum threshold at which the body can operate yeah, adaptively. Yeah. In the same way you can't just what you can't work harder. If you're working if you're working a salaried job, getting paid X and just work more and more hours, you're not getting any more. You're just doing more for the same amount and actually potentially you're actually decreasing your hourly rate in yeah, doing so exactly. in the same way that by eating and, into and the quality of that yeah, work is, is, is eating into yeah. eating into your adaptive energy more than is required as we always say finding the minimum effective dosage of training for the maximum effective adaptation yeah. so, well, that's, that's as, really as you spill above I that had, yeah. it's yeah. diminishing returns and whether it's this hustle bro grind bro culture of bullshit that we see more and more these days trying to be the best hybrid athlete in the world and just listing, oh, I'm training three day, three times a day. Training three times a day is not the way to be good at these things. That's that's just a way of you, if, if you enjoy doing that, absolutely fantastic, yeah. but it's not the most effective way to physiologically adapt consistently. Nobody's training three times a day consistently. If they are, they're not maximizing their potential or they're an absolute fucking freak. Or they're just doing it for fun and that's absolutely fine. Just to, just to really highlight that yeah, point, or, but or, it's... Or they have, uh you know, they're professionals and can sleep in between these boats or whatever it might be. It's, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's just not. But then normal. again, when Michael Phelps is training three days a week, he's not bursting himself in every session so he well, can, look, exactly. good, so he can look good in a reel. That, that's the key <laughs> detail. That's the key yeah. detail. So I think, I think yeah, yeah the, the, the real key point to underline here from a strength and marathon point of view is that you can't 
rely on the advice and experience of those that haven't been operating within the same circumstances, which is why the conventional understanding of mileage and volume in running for a marathon needs to be looked at and understood, but taken a bit critically because you're applying it to your own context with your own lifting body composition background so that you can take from both parties to determine what works best for you to adapt towards the goals that you want to get to. If you go into a marathon prep saying, I must be running X amount of miles per week by this point alongside lifting four days a week, you will hit a point where you cannot effectively recover and move forwards at the pace that you would were you doing more or the right amount with less. And ultimately, the ideal in many ways for us, as we always kind of cynically say, is you want to be as doing as little training as possible for as much adaptation as possible. Yeah, this, this minimum dose, uh, maximum uh, 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 benefit makes so much sense in, in any context it makes so much sense why, why would you why would you work harder for less you, you want to work less for more uh, and and the key thing that we said right from the very beginning of this conversation that you're trying to maximize is opportunity to recover and when are you adapting when is your body uh, you know uh, making these adaptations physiologically when you're bloody recovering you know hence everybody banging on about the sleep is, is right uh, and if you've if you've knocked your sleep on the head because you're training three times a day trying to do all this fucking arbitrary number, I need to hit that number. I need to go out there and do another hour. Uh, you're not recovering from that. Um, so uh, the takeaway there is junk volume is junk. Same applies to lifting as well. Junk lifting, unless it's junk. face pulls. I don't think you can ever do too many face pulls Band as long the as they're about RP seven, no higher, no higher. Okay. Powerlifting training is basically squat, bench, deadlift, and three sets of fifteen face pulls. Rinse and repeat. Make progress for as long as you can, yeah. and then inevitably get bored of it and give up. <laughs> I kid. I kid. Powerlifting. I kid. summarize. I kid. I jest. I love. I love powerlifting. But powerlifting. Maybe it's the Go. face pulls that ruined it for me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we have uh, been variety. quite. It sounds like variety was, was necessary. We uh, we have been quite non-specific in terms of what you guys can take away to apply to your own training. So let's use the template of our strength and marathon to paint a picture as to what all of this waffle we've just gone through means. So yeah. I'll You've I'll give an overview. Let's go through. What did you say? Week nine. Uh, yeah, this is week nine. So there's there's a there's a good amount of work that underpins this. The structure yeah, is largely through, the same. We've gone through an introductory phase and got people used to sort of a little bit of volume and, and getting used to the program. So now we're in the meat and, meat and potatoes. potatoes of it. So what I'll do, first of all, is I'll run through the week, Monday through Sunday, just top line, what each session is. I'll then read out the actual specific components of each session, and then we'll just explain a little bit as to why it's put together that way before we close things off. So week nine, Monday. Lower body and track road reps. Track all road reps, that is. Mm-hmm. Tuesday, upper body and 40 minutes of low-intensity steady-state aerobic work. Uh-huh. Wednesday, fart like running, about an hour's work. Thursday, low-intensity steady-state aerobic work, an hour. Friday, full body and pre-fatigue work, which means that there is a little bit of running at the back end, three miles off the back of a horrible squat lunge overhead press pyramid, to be specific. Sorry Anyone listening that. that's done that, you'll know what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. And then a two-hour, 45-minute aerobic run at the weekend, and Sunday is rest. And I think it's important at this point, feeding in from point number three as well, if the thought of a rest day makes you uncomfortable, that is something to address because that could be something that's actually inhibiting your progress. Oh, very much. Okay, so week nine. I refer back to my often stated Cavendish quote. I wish I'd had the bravery and courage to rest. Would have been a gold medalist way, way earlier. There you are. There you are. Okay, week nine, Monday, day one, we'll call it. Lower body, back squat, five sets of three, barbell front rack reverse lunges, three sets of oh, fucking max good reps. RPE eight for max good reps. Yeah. That, that, that doesn't week. make sense, uh, though. No, RPE eight. That needs to change. That's one of the things that when I was yeah. rattling through it. Fucking, we'll get this right. Do we need to read the whole program out? I Is think it so. It's just, it's just so people know what it looks like. It's a sell, effectively. It's not good for a podcast, but it's good for us. Um, Okay, week nine, Monday, day one. Lower body, back squats, five sets to three, barbell, front rack, reverse lunges, three sets of eight, and good mornings, three sets of 12. Into that evening, a.m., p.m., ideally for this one, six, 800 meters at RP9 with two minutes of rest between sets. Tuesday morning, or Tuesday, we'll just call it, 
Bench press superset with bent over rows, kneeling overhead press supersetted with croc rows, single arm dumbbell inclined bench press supersetted with rear delt flies into some low intensity steady state aerobic work that evening. Wednesday is a fartlek run, which is essentially two minutes low zone three, seven minutes low zone four, three minutes low zone three, three minutes mid to high zone four. This is the hard bit. And then five minutes in low zone three with a cool down and a warm up at the front end. So just varied paced speed play effectively. Thursday, an hour of low intensity steady state aerobic work. Friday's pre-fatigue is deadlifts, horizontal rows, dumbbell hammer curls, and diamond push-ups into an ascending pyramid of doom, which is squats, lunges, behind the neck overhead press, all the way up to a big old set at 80 reps across the board on squats and lunges with 10 behind the neck overhead presses. And then you're done. Just kidding. You're all the way back down to where you started with 10 reps on each into a three mile run at the back end. That's a horrible day. I've done that many times myself. I, I was effectively the guinea pig for that session. And for that, I do not apologize to anyone doing it yeah. because I also yeah. went through it. You're welcome. And then Saturday is two hours, 45 minutes of 45 minutes of low intensity, steady state aerobic work with warm up and cool down included. And then Sunday is rest. So that contextualizes a lot of what we said, but I think day by day, let's just highlight the intention behind each thing. The specific detail, Johnny, Monday. Uh, Monday, we'll go through this real fast. Monday, lower body, high intensity work. So in the gym, we're doing lower body, high intensity resistance work, as you said, 85% and above of your one rep max. And then in the afternoon or straight after, if you can if you can split it that way, depending on your timelines, uh, we're doing high intensity sprint. So as stated at the beginning of the, of, of the uh, podcast, we're talking about a day focused on relatively low volume and relatively high intensity work. So that's our day one of high intensity. Day two, Tuesday, we're more or less mimicking the same profile, except we're looking at upper body. So we've got a lower upper body split. Were this a triathlon training plan, we'd have high intensity swimming that day as well. That's right. For That's reference. exactly what we do there. Yeah, yeah. Good, good point. Um, uh, and, and we use that opportunity. This is us week nine into the program. So we've built a little bit of aerobic capacity and we're using the opportunity within the week to add some more lists programming. So we've got low intensity, steady state work there, which isn't draining, isn't particularly fatiguing. We actually suggest that's a day that people can perhaps do that on the bike uh, to, to avoid... Um, overplay on, on vertical displacement. I have in Johnny Payne, please preserve your knees. Um, there's plenty of people like me. Wednesday, we're into a, at this part of the program, we're into fartlek running. So fartlek, as you said earlier on, is speed play. Uh, and we're operating just under threshold and pushing just above threshold and kind of moving backwards and forwards between that uh, th that, that area of, of um, uh, speed and adaption uh, and, and really trying to push our threshold opportunity up. And practically speaking, great way of drilling perception of pacing yeah. and oh, feeling of, feeling of yeah. pacing and, and understanding how to interact best with your watch for race day strategy, all that oh, sort of stuff. loads there, yeah. And, and we try and take people through that within the program as well. But ultimately, when, when we're looking at within that kind of volume uh, and intensity crossover, uh, this is where we have the kind of the, the basic crossover here. Is, is This is where the X meets in the middle. We're, we're looking at that kind of threshold point. Uh, and as we go in later on into the week, on the Thursday, we've got another opportunity for low intensity steady state work. So building that aerobic capacity, which is clearly foundational. Uh, Friday, perhaps for another podcast in actual fact, but we use this as our, our kind of uh, uh, staple, which is a, a pre-fatigue day. So we've got a relatively low intensity, relatively high volume session to set us up beforehand, uh, straight into a very difficult, <laughs> uh, psychologically difficult, and there's a point to that as well, uh, session where, where we're looking at very uh, low in terms of your overall uh, uh, maximal percentage, but a lot of repeat work. And we're looking at this sort of biomechanical demand there, straight off the back of a lot of lunging, essentially, which is the, the one that you, you quoted there is based around straight into a run. Uh, so you're running under a lot of biomechanical fatigue. Compromised running, exactly which is that. which is a very popular term at the moment. Um, There's lots more to it than, than just that. And, and that's something that I think uh, Dr. Phil and I, with yourself, will we'll go into some detail. Uh, but that's, that's the body of that day. Uh, and as we say, the intensity is now lowered quite substantially, but the, the volume is, is, is up the other end of the scale. And then we're into a very traditional, very obvious, we, we're going out on, on the Saturday in this case uh, and doing a relatively long aerobic run, which is ultimately marathon practice as well. Uh, and that will be under a certain amount of fatigue from that previous day as well. Uh, so across the board, we're looking to get, we, we have focus sessions focused on every part of that equation that we've, we've drilled down through the, the course of this podcast. Uh, high intensity at the beginning, drilled down into low intensity at the end, low volume, to high volume. 
And as we get closer and closer to the race day, those Saturdays and the midweek stuff will become more and more pace specific to the task at hand. Exactly. Whereas yeah. at this point, week nine, it's still a little bit more foundational where aerobic work is dominant, whilst also raising work capacity through the things that we reference. So hopefully with that context and everything that we've ran through, that helps piece together a little bit of our logic as to how you can balance strength and marathon training. If you're sitting there thinking, they haven't told me what I should do with my programming. That's because we can't in a podcast format, exactly. but we can via the website. Shameless plug, but also... We do occasionally get comments from people saying, well, they haven't told me exactly what to do at what time of the day and this, that, and well, the other. And that is the thing. You so, cannot do that in yeah. this world because it requires your goals. Yes, exactly. We could sit here for another 14 hours of this podcast and we're still not at the bottom of what you want. But if you want to con us, contact us directly, uh, we feel like we've got some answers. Yep. Yep. And I think the, the overarching point, which applies to everything, to get better at an individual sport like High Rocks, individual sport being an individual discipline i know it can be done as doubles before anyone goes what an idiot he doesn't know anything about it um <laughs> a, a single discipline sport whilst there are different components within it, it is the sport is high rocks um in the same way that the sport of the decathlon is the sport of the decathlon you need to train the individual components of what makes that up Absolutely. and that is how you make progress towards a better overall performance as you layer skill work on top, just doing full send race specific skill work is not the way to get there in the same way that with strength and marathon prep. If you were just doing heavy singles as if you were going to test a one RM and just doing the marathon pace specific work, you would probably be four weeks deep with a torn calf. you have gone backwards in progress. You hated your training and you thought you're going to take up tiddlywinks full time as your training recreational activity. And I don't know about anyone listening, but my ambition extends beyond tiddlywinks full time. I mean, even without the injury. To any full-time Tiddly Winkers yeah. listening, well I don't. Done, I, well I mean, no Good offense. Luck. We obviously <laughs> sing from different hymn sheets, but th that is that is that that is that. Yep. Thank you for listening. Hope everybody enjoyed that. If you do have any questions, do please reach out, or more importantly, go to YouTube and comment it in the comment section so everybody can see it. That'd be yeah, the most useful place that. to do it. And subscribe whilst you're there, please. Thank you. Cheers. Much appreciated. That's awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. And goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs>